Bless the Lord. Amen. You may be seated, church. Amen. Now, Pastor Dave, um, I mentioned to him that we, we're busy with communion today. And um, it's our communion service. But in May, when I'm, we're gone overseas, Pastor Dave will preach one Sunday at, at church here in May. Amen. So how many of you are going to be glad to listen to him preach? All right, so one of the Sundays, which one, whichever one he's available, uh, he, he'll come and share God's word with us. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you are expecting this God to do great things? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles, please turn in your Bibles. And um, the theme for our month, as I'm asking you to turn uh, to Revelations chapter 12, verse number 11. Just understand the theme for the month. Um, the Chronicles are out for Feb. And the theme is making an extraordinary impact in my church. All right? That's the theme for the month. And this is, uh, uh, I want to make, that means it's personalized. I want to make an extraordinary impact in my church. I'd like you please to read the, the partnership letter because I speak um, comprehensively of how to connect yourself. And then, of course, all the articles I felt in my heart with all the articles to talk about how you should celebrate your church and celebrate your pastor and celebrate the gift of God. See, God gives a gift to you. Your job is to receive the gift. That's, all, that's how easy it is. I don't know why people complicate it. You, you recognize a gift and then you receive it. So the Chronicle for Feb is ready, and that's, you can get, if you don't have your copy, you can get that out in the foyer. But today, just teaching on deliverance and all of all the meetings we've had, uh, I want to take you to Revelations chapter 12, and I'd like you to read with me in verse number 11. And I want to go kind of quickly because I want to talk about the blood. Say amen to that. I'll talk about the blood. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 11, the Bible says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Can I repeat that? Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, And they overcame him, talking about the devil, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That means us as believers. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto death. Now, I want us to consider what it means to overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Because this is an absolutely precious truth. Because we've dealt with many things regarding, you know, in the deliverance service. We talked about many things, we spoke about many things, we uncovered many things. And thank God now for the blood of Jesus that has now cleansed our past. Come on, somebody. Amen. Taken away every curse, because every curse over your life has been shattered and broken in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, but now the precious treasure of truth that I want you to see is that we overcome Satan. So we overcome Satan when we testify. So how do we overcome Satan? When we testify to what the Word of God says the blood of Jesus does. See, that's important. We overcome uh, by what we say that the Word of God does. Now, I want to make the following confession, if you would please. So say this, one, two, three, go with me. Say one, one, two, three. We overcome Satan... When we, when we testify personally what the Word of God says, the blood does for us. Amen. All right, now I want to take you to another truth in Scripture that talks about the sevenfold shedding of the blood of Jesus. Now, we find that Jesus shed his blood in seven places just prior to his crucifixion. All right, and this is what we want to talk about. The first one was in the Garden of Gethsemane, where his sweat fell like great drops of blood onto the ground. This is when, when Jesus was praying, 
fervently, great sweats of blood fell off his face. That was the one time. Then at the house of the high priest, we found we found that at the house of the high priest, they began, began to strike Jesus' face with the rods, and that brought out the blood. The blood was spilled then for the second time. And then the third time, at some point, they plucked his beard out in tufts, and that caused him to bleed. That was the third time. Then again, in the house or the courts of Pontius Pilate, they scourged him with a whip and tore open his flesh. And this is where his whole body was marred. And this is where, again, Jesus, for the fourth time, shed his blood. But then after that, there was a fifth time. And this was when they planted a crown of thorns on his head. And you remember they mocked him, calling him the king of the Jews. In mockery they did this. But when they forced, historians tell us that the thorns in Israel is pretty long and sharp. But when they made the crown of thorns and they began to force it down his face, it began to cut and rip through his skin into his skull. And that caused Jesus to bleed again the fifth time. And the Bible also tells us that it came to a point where you could not recognize him. And then the sixth time when he shed his blood was when he was nailed to the cross. The Bible says that they drove nails into his feet and to his hands when they nailed him onto the cross. And then on the seventh time a soldier thrust a spear into his side when he was dead. And the Bible says, and water and blood gushed out. That was the seventh time that he shed his blood. The Bible says, this was the sevenfold prediction of the sprinkling of the day of atonement. I want to bring you then to Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11. The Bible says, for the life of of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul and this was the prediction of the cross then Isaiah 53 12 and the prophet Isaiah prophetically speaks these words he says therefore will I divide him a portion with great with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he had poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So this means that Jesus poured out his soul in and through his blood, the shedding of his blood. And Jesus became, you need to understand this, Jesus became the final sin offering. But the point is, and the question is now asked, how do we appropriate the blood of Jesus and apply it personally in our own lives? That's what I'm going to answer now. In Revelation 12, 11, as I bring you back to that scripture, the Bible says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. See, here's the issue. Christians ought to love Jesus more than their own lives. Now, there is a direct conflict. May I bring this point in? There's a direct conflict between Christians and Satan. And we overcome by two specific things. These are the two specific things the Scriptures are talking about. How do we overcome the enemy? Number one, the blood of the Lamb. Say the blood of the Lamb. And number two, the word of our testimony. Say the word of our testimony. So those are the two ways you overcome the enemy. How? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You know, when a soldier, 
uh, uh, talking about the last part, it says, and I love not their lives unto death. You know, when a soldier joins the army, he, he knows that there is some, there's some risk involved. That means when he joins the army, he doesn't ask the person that recruits him to give him a guarantee that he will not die or a guarantee that he would be safe. It's just taken for granted the fact that when I kind of join the army, there's that risk. But my zeal for my country, my zeal for being in the armed forces overrides that. And when we become Christians, we must understand that there will be conflict with Satan. I said there will be conflict with Satan. We're not on a cruise ship going on holiday. We're dealing with real stuff. Yes, you'll have victories, but there's some fights to be fought. Say amen to that. So, so you can't be kind of weak in the army of God. You've got to be strong. That's why the Bible tells us, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Now, 1 John 2.17 says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. As long as you do the will of God, the Bible says you will abide forever. Now, let's talk about the Passover ceremony. Now, let us consider what it means to overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I'll take you to another scripture found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. The Bible says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And then 1 Corinthians 5, 8 says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of of sincerity and truth. The next verse says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or the extortioners, or idolaters, for then must you needs go into the world. Now, in Exodus 12, verses 21, the Bible says, Then Moses called for the elders of Israel, and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to the families, and kill the Passover. Verse 22. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood, and in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that's in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. See, here's an issue, guys that I want to bring to you what I shared with you early on. Sometimes what happens is when we apply the blood and when we're in the house, we've got to stay in the house to enjoy the covering. And when you step out of that, then you step out the covering. See, as long as you're walking in the light and having fellowship with God, God covers you. But if you step out in the darkness again, there's no protection. Are you with me? So Exodus 12.23 says, for the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. Say amen to that. Amen. Now I want to point to you a tremendous responsibility to fathers. Because the fathers of Israel had to apply the blood. See, today, we kind of like almost have a fatherless generation. Because we either have absentee fathers or dysfunctional fathers or fathers that have absconded. And we don't have people brought up under the tutorship and the protection of a father. And in the house of God, it's the same thing. People don't want to submit because of rebellion. They don't want to submit to the authority that God placed over them. In terms of the fivefold ministry gifts that God has given to the church. And God has given them to you. But you need to submit, clothe yourself, the Bible says, with humility. And come under authority. So that you may be fathered and schooled. The Apostle Paul says, you have 1,000 instructors, yet you have not many fathers. 
See, today we have a lot of instructors, but not anyone fathering you. Because a father will always tell you sometimes things you don't want to listen to. See, a father will always correct you and rebuke you. A father always brings you back in alignment with God's will and plan and purpose. And what I am saying to you today as a church, understand that as we partake of the communion emblems before us, that there is that principle of fatherhood. First in the family, men have to take their place. And where the men are absent, then the women have to take that place to pray over the family, to protect the family, to instruct the family in the things of God, to live a godly life. And when we come to church, you might be older than me, but still, as a leader, you need to be fathered. You say, but I cannot respect pastor because he's younger than me. But then how can you call Jesus Lord because he died when he was 33? See, that's religion. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. So you might be a few years older than me, but you say, but I can't listen to that man. But you call, you call, you, you call Jesus Lord. He died at 33. I long past that age. Pastor, a, pastor Dave is double that age, plus more. So I don't get the reasoning. See, it's not that God wants you to honor the man for the sake of honoring the man. God wants you to honor the office so that you can get the blessings that come out of the office. That's why it's written in the commandment, honor your father and your mother. That God will give you long life. That's talking about your natural parents. But with it comes a blessing. But may I add to that, that you also have to honor your spiritual parents with honor so that God can get you stuff that you need in your life, that God can multiply you, God can bless you. Come on here, somebody. See, it is like Lot, when Lot joined Abraham, <laughs> and people make this mistake all the time, when Lot joined Abraham, do you know what God said to Abraham first? He says, you go out, don't take nobody with you. You know what Abraham did? Abraham took his father and he took Lot. Lot was too much. He was, because God didn't tell him to take Lot. But you see, after a while, what Lot did was, Lot thought, Ha! Ah, this is great, my herds are growing. <laughs> my flocks are growing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, wow, I'm good. This thing works. But what Lot forgot was his joining with Abraham caused the grace and the giftings of God to flow that he started to prosper. So Abraham said to him, listen, you choose. The land is too big. Our herdsmen are fighting. You choose. If you choose left, I go right. You choose right, I go left. Lot made a mistake. Instead of Lot saying to his Uncle Abraham says, you're the senior, the grace is on your life, you choose, wherever you send me, I know. With your blessing, I'll still make it. He forgot. So it's like that with the people of God at church. They forget after God prospers you. And after God gives you a couple of things, then you forget where you prospered. <laughs> Can I get a louder amen? Amen. You start to forget that you prospered in the house of God. May I tell you something from my own testimony. I prospered in the house of God. Before I met God, I was nothing. Before I met God, I was nobody. Let me tell you, my prosperity came when I started to honor men and women of God. Now you can give me a louder amen than that. Yeah, going to church, honoring the man of God. Going to church, honoring the man of God. With that came prosperity, from prosperity. But God always told me, keep myself. He, this, is what, this is what the Lord said to me, and I want to share with you. God always said to me, he said, keep yourself small in your own eyes. See, that's a mistake some people kind of make. They don't keep themselves small in their own eyes. See, because as God starts to prosper them, they get bigger. They get puffed up. Arrogance, pride. <laughs> and what does the Bible say about arrogance and pride? It comes 
before the fall, right? See what I'm saying? So you must keep yourself small in your own eyes. In other words, God, it's you. <laughs> I drive this car because of you. I dress like this because of you. I have a wonderful family because of you. I'm prospering because of you. I have this house because of you. In testings, when I overcome the testings, the trials, it's because of you. When I'm sick, Lord God, even though the doctors assist me, but because it's you, Lord, you are Jehovah Rapha. It is you. I'm still under the blood. So it gives no room for arrogance. gives no room for pride. And sometimes it will look like you're weak. Because when people see humility, they think it's weakness. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not. Humility is strength. Because it's harnessed power. It is power, but harnessed power. The Bible said of Moses, he was the meekest man. But when he came back, think about this. When God spoke to him, he says, Moses, you be my spokesman. Moses said, no, Lord, no, 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 not me. He was a stutterer. God says, no problem, I'll get Aaron to be a spokesperson. But when he stood before Pharaoh, when he threw his rod, <laughs> he saw results. You see, meek people get results. Meek people, God moves with his power. Come on here, somebody. Don't be afraid of being meek. It's not weakness. Meekness is humility. Humility of the spirit is a beautiful character. It's like an aroma. When you see a meek person, a humble person, it's an aroma. You can see Christ has done something with this person. Come on, say amen to me. Hallelujah. Now, I'll bring you to two uh, uh, points that I want you to note. Number one, the blood in the basin will not help you and will not protect a single person. It is required to be transferred from the basin to the door. Let me explain that. See, what God told him to do was, he said, he said, take the hyssop, he says, take the blood, and he says, sprinkle it on the lintels and on the doorpost. You see that? See, if they didn't take the blood from the basin and apply it, there was no protection. Now, bring it to the new covenant. How do we do it? It's by our confession. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. So, we must testify what the blood has done. See, no confession, no high priest. No confession, no protection. So in today, the New Testament, what we must do is constantly say what the blood has done. Say amen to that. All right, I'll take you to a scripture in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Notice what comes before sprinkling, obedience. Before you sprinkle the blood, there must be obedience. Paul now says that Christ has become our Passover. So we are in the same situation like Israel. We have to get the blood from the basin to the lintel and the doorpost. We have to get the blood uh, from the basin, by the confession of our mouth, to where we live. Revelations 12, 11 again says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Hebrews 3, 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. So that means we must make our words agree. With the word of God. We must make our words agree. Do not say you are sick, weak, disgusted and busted. Do not make excuses when people see you prospering. Don't make excuses why you are prospering. Just say God is good. Yeah, but pastor, I'm afraid they'll envy me. Yeah, of course you'll be envied. It's part of the package. When prosperity will come your way, it's part of the package. They'll envy you. Oh, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how she's doing it. I wonder how she's doing it. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Well, let them wonder. 
God says in these signs and wonders shall follow you. Say amen. amen. Let them wonder. You are a sign and a wonder. I said you are a sign and a wonder. Listen, let me share some of you people. I, I, I mean, you, you're probably when you're looking around, you don't have much now. Let me, let me, let me inform you. Let, let me get you ready uh, for, for what God's going to do for you. You might have very little now. It won't be long. It won't be long because you'll have so much stuff that God's going to expand you and prosper you. And He's going to give you some uncommon victories. He's going to give you some uncommon things because you're going to do some uncommon things. He's going to require you to do some uncommon things. But that doesn't matter because I know I have an uncommon God. And God is looking for People that would, 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 would say so, so that he can show himself strong. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are the redeemed of the Lord. So begin to say so. Oh, time is gone. Time is gone. I want to talk about the sevenfold application of the blood of Jesus. And what today, in today's time... What it means to us. But time is gone. Maybe we'll do that the next time. But I just want to say, the blood carries power. Amen. Just keep on staying under the blood. I said, keep on staying under the blood. I get up in the morning and say, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I cover my mind, my soul, my spirit, my body. Can the ushers and deacons, please help me. We can get the communion emblems out. The pastors come, please. You understand, I keep on covering myself under the blood of Jesus. I pray for you. I cover you under the blood of Jesus. I say, Lord, no accident, no plague, no calamity, no sickness, no destruction. Say that over your life. Cover your life with the blood of Jesus. Cover your children with the blood of Jesus. Say amen to that. Cover your home with the blood of Jesus. Cover everything you possess with the blood of Jesus. Do not be afraid. Use your mouth, brothers and sisters. Keep on speaking God's word over your life. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. Say amen to that. I shall not be afraid. The Lord is my exceeding great reward. I'm covered by the blood. As long as we are under the blood, Satan can't touch you. I said, Satan can't touch you. He can't touch you. And this is the time for divine exchange. And I'm saying to you, your weakness is becoming your strength right now. The stuff that you don't have and you desire, now that gets to you because of this. Say amen to that. Hallelujah. I used to, at one time, I used to preach and say, and this was wrong, and I repent for that. But I used to say, this is symbolic. And it is not symbolic. This is, the bread is the flesh. And the wine is his blood. It's not symbolic. It is. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. But it is. So when we take the bread, we eat his flesh. When we take of the communion wine, we drink his blood. Say amen to that. Now, while you're receiving it, can I say, I just want to maybe share the contrast between Abel's blood and Jesus' blood. Can I just share something on that? while you're receiving the communion emblem. Let me just give you three things about Abel's blood in comparison to Jesus' blood. Abel's blood was shed against his will. Jesus willingly gave up his blood. Abel's blood was sprinkled on the earth. Jesus' blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. That's why the Bible says we have a high priest. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with our infirmities, our weaknesses, our feelings. But we have a high priest who's touched in all points because he was tempted like us. Abel's blood calls out for vengeance. Jesus' blood calls out for mercy. Thank God for the blood. 
Because each one of us, in whatever area we need mercy this morning, we can say, God, thank you. We need mercy. Thank you. Because that's what you represent to me as a person. I need help. I need strength. I need your ability. I need you to come through for me, Lord. There's so many places I'm limping in my life. And I need mercy to make my walk strong, to give me strength. There's so many broken places in my life, but God, I need you to fix it. And God says, if you would ask, I will come. If you will call me. Remember Joel 2.32? They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God shall hear them. God will come to you. That's all you have to do today. Because Jesus' blood is merciful. Thank God for the mercy. I said, thank God for the mercy. As you receive the emblems, would you please stand? Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. We have access through the blood of Jesus. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Would you tell your neighbor, thank God for the blood. Thank God. Thank God for the bread. Thank God. Thank God. Now, I want you to say this with me, please, if you will. Say, Lord Jesus, we receive this bread as your flesh. Now eat. Now, church, receive his mercy because God loves you. That's the message I want to bring to you today. God loves you unconditionally. When he looks at you, he's compassionate over you. He's compassionate over your family. He's compassionate where you're struggling. He sees the different areas of your life where you have weaknesses and he wants to help you. So today, that's the help you have received because you have received strength now. You've received his mercy. Now take the blood and say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive the cup as your blood. And as I do this, I proclaim your death until you come. Now you may receive and drink. I want to declare to you as a church, as you remain standing, that the blood cleanses you from all sin, unrighteousness. Now, may the Lord prosper you. May the Lord help you. May He uphold you, lift you up. May His wisdom come upon you to guide you, to lead you, to help you. May the Lord give you witty inventions, ideas, concepts, dreams, visions, to do the uncommon. May the Lord connect you to the right people at the right time. May God give you kara today. You know what that means. It's divine encounters and success. May the Lord give you success today. Divine encounters. And may the Lord multiply you, increase you in every way, shape, and form. Not because you deserve it, but because of His grace, and because of His mercy, and because of His compassion. Get ready for growth. Get ready for expansion. Get ready for increase. I just touch someone next door to you and say, get ready for increase because I'm, 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 I'm just about to, you, you, you understand, I'm just about to. <laughs> I'm not just saying it to keep you happy. I'm saying it by the Spirit of the Lord. Get ready for increase. I'm going to expand. Not by might. Not by power. But by my Spirit, saith the Lord. See, some of you come here this morning in a difficult position, you've come here not knowing what's your next step. You don't know whether to go left or right. You don't know what to do. But God, my God, 
like the Apostle Paul said, my God, you know, when he was talking Corinthians, he says, my God shall supply all your needs. You see, see he, 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 he made it personal. He says, but my God. Now listen, I'm convinced that my God is able to carry you. My God will help you. My God will bless you. My God will supply all your need liberally. My God will help you. There's some court cases that will be wiped out and taken away and fall before Him. There's some legal stuff that you are facing will break before you and God will give you the victory. There's some big bills that you're facing. It might be bonds and car notes, but God can cancel that. Now you keep on paying it till God gives you the manifestation. And all of a sudden, sometimes God will just cause a huge check, an EFT. <laughs> I know. Someone's sitting with a check for you. I know that. I was praying, I was asking the Lord, I mean, I'm bringing myself and using myself as, as an example. I was praying, I have so many needs for the church, you know, and they're huge needs. I, I mean, it's just not small, it's huge. So I, I started to calculate and it's running into the millions. I said, Lord, somebody's got my money. <laughs> and, so, and so I started to withdraw from my heavenly account. And I took that scripture, my God shall liberally supply all my needs. And I said, Lord, somebody's got my check. I don't know who it is, but somebody's got my check. Somebody's got my money because as they give it to me, then the church can explode and expand and we can do what, come on here, somebody. Are you with me? Somebody, somebody, somebody's got it. Now, as I'm saying it to you about me, somebody's got something of yours. And what the enemy stolen from you, he must restore sevenfold. Not one, not two, not three, sevenfold. Now, 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 I'm not preaching to you. This is a prophetic act. Sevenfold. See, guys, listen. I, I studied criminology and psychology and all that didn't help me. I remember I used to go to church sometimes and the pastor would be preaching and I'd stand there stiff, wouldn't be able to clap my hands, move, you know, I was that type of guy. No, really, I was. I was crazy. I was, I was nutty. And I, and I couldn't. And I, I would go home and I'd fast and I'd cry and pray and I'd cry and I'd pray and I'd cry and I'd pray. I'd say, God, 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 plead. I'm pleading and pleading. And God said to me one day, he said, stop pleading, start seeding. That was the end of my misery. See, I, I, see, you, you think I'm trying to, I, I'm not pulling a joke on you. I was stupid too. Stupid squared. Cube maybe. <laughs> Serious, I used to cry. I used to go on my knees, cry, Lord, I love you so much. Oh God, please come through for me. And God said to me, no, stand up, shut up. And just seed so that I can get stuff to you. Once I learned that secret, my life changed. And so will your life change. Just tell your neighbor, just tell your neighbor, my suffering is over. No, no, say it like you really mean it. Say, uh, come on, I want you to prophesy. My suffering is over. Tell somebody else, my, my suffering days are over. No, 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 it's over. It's over now, 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 now. It's over now. It's over now. Not tomorrow, not next week, now. Faith. Faith is now, now, now. It's now, 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 now. Faith is now. You got it now. That means when you walk out of church here, you must smile. Because things are about to change. Huh? The Lord told me, was I was praying for this meeting, the Lord told me, He says, one Sunday, I can't preach. The, the church is going to testify the whole service. That's what we're going to do. We're going to testify the whole service. Breakthrough upon breakthrough upon breakthrough upon breakthrough upon breakthrough. Say amen. Hallelujah. That's my prayer for you. Hallelujah. 
<laughs> now, I'm not an actor, you understand. I, I'm, I'm just getting happy. The Holy Ghost. I'm just getting drunk in the spirit. You know, you know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. So things are about to change for you. Amen. 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 Now, let me give you the, um, the, the, the announcements quickly before I say the grace and, and release you. I'm sorry I went over the time, didn't I? A couple of minutes. I apologize deeply. <laughs> See, not everybody's saying that. So that means you've been watching the time. I said, I apologize. Don't worry, don't worry. You're reminding me of the guy one time I went to Mauritius. We said to the taxi driver, turn left. He says, no problem. He said, turn right. No problem. Spin around. No problem. Everything's no problem. <laughs> Amen.